we want to give a really warm welcome to Dr. Elizabeth Toby Kellogg. Toby is the Robert E. King Distinguished Investigator at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center in St. Louis, Missouri. And she's an associate of the Harvard University Herbaria. She's a plant scientist with classical training in systematics and is best known for her work on the comparative biology of cereal crops and their wild relatives in the grass family. Her lab addresses how evolution has produced a huge diversity of grasses and how humans can harness that diversity to unlock the genetic potential of cereal crops. She holds a BA and PhD degree from uh, Harvard University, where she also did her postdoctoral work. She has an MS degree from the University of Idaho and an honorary doctorate from the Universidad Nacional de Cordoba, Argentina. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and is an Academica Fellow of the Academia Nacional de Ciencias Argentina. Um, she told me over dinner tonight that she grew up in Nashua, New Hampshire, so I didn't know she was a native New Englander too. Um, so wonderful to have you back in New England with us, Toby, and we're just delighted that you agreed to be our first speaker of the year here um, for the New England Botanical Society. Thank you, and everyone join me in welcoming Toby Kellogg. Okay, well, thanks so much for the invitation, um, and thanks for the introduction and all the technical help. Um, you know, it's, it's really great to be here. It's great to be in New England. Um, yeah, I'm from New England. And so I think of this very much as home, although I've been in Missouri for the last 25 years. And so I'm going to be talking today about ecosystems there, mostly, uh, with some connections to New England. <clears throat> and specifically, I'm going to be talking about the grasses of the prairies. Uh, and the outline of today's talk is, is here. Um, I'll start with a few words about the tall grass prairie ecosystem, um, and then spend a certain amount of time on introducing you to some of the major prairie grasses um, and their morphology and distributions. I'll then talk about what happened to the tall grass prairie because there's not much of it left. Um, and then if there's time, I'll say a few words about rebuilding the prairie, uh, but I'll watch the clock. So I promise you'll be home by breakfast time. Um, if we look at a map of the United States, this area in the middle that is a slightly peculiar shade of green uh, represents the prairies. This is an iconic American landscape. Um, and as you can see, it covers a good chunk of the continent you're probably all aware that there is a gradient of rainfall across the country where it's a bit wet on this side and it gets drier and drier until you get to the front range in the Intermountain West and then it starts getting a little wetter on the, the west side. And this precipitation gradient basically controls what communities are there along with other environmental factors. So the prairies, the areas that are known as prairies are again, the center part of the continent. And the ecosystem I'm gonna be talking about today is the tall grass prairie, uh, which is characterized by tall grasses, clever name. Um, the farther west you get, it's drier. The grasses are shorter, that's the mixed prairie. And then as you get close to the rain shadow of the Rockies, it's quite dry and this is, these are very short, short grasses. <clears throat> so we're gonna be focusing today on the tall grass prairie, which is shown here in Oklahoma, tall grass prairie preserve, uh, absolutely beautiful landscape uh, and an area that at one stage covered a lot of land area. Here's more tall grass prairie in Kansas. This is the Kansa prairie. Again, this is a, one of the few really large preserves of this landscape. The maps that I just showed you are a little bit misleading because if you actually look at the main plants of the prairie, any individual one has a range substantially wider than what you saw in, in these maps. So for instance, there are areas in Texas where you get perfectly good prairie plants even though you, this is not usually considered part of the, the tall grass prairie. 
This is Sutter Prairie in North Carolina. So it's not like everything's in the Midwest. And you do see some of the sort of classic prairie plants even here in, in Maine and other parts of, of New England. So it's, it's not like it's this monolithic ecosystem. The individual species extend a good ways. But let's look really closely at this area, the tall grass prairie. In that area, in fact, it is wet enough that trees can grow just fine. It's, so it's not, the fact that it's grasses isn't controlled solely by the precipitation. A lot of the prairie is maintained by combination of grazing, particularly like this guy, and fire. So obviously there's some big herbivores and historically these were the things that prevented tree growth and continued to regenerate the grasses in the prairie. So we've got bison and elk and antelope and deer uh, throughout the range. In addition, there's fire. And some of my ecologist colleagues refer to fire as, a, as another herbivore. That is, it basically does the same thing. It consumes vegetation. And it's a fire adapted ecosystem. Uh, just to give you a flavor of this, I found this nice series of photos of a, a burn, the effects of a burn in a prairie in Wisconsin, where in the year in which they did this controlled burn, this is a picture on April 8th before they burned it. And then of course, after they burned it, it looks burned. Um, there's absolutely nothing left, but in two weeks, it's starting to green up. These are perennial plants so that they start sending leaves up you know, very soon after the burn, three months, it's, it's back to being large, really sturdy and substantial green plants. And then six months, it's pretty much back to where it was. So the burning is standard. In fact, if you're going to be maintaining a prairie, you do need to burn it um, in this tall grass ecosystem. That, and that's what keeps the trees out. So let me just move on then to an introduction to some of the plants of the prairie and particularly the grasses. And so I'm going to skip the charismatic megaflora. Um, you all know Leatris and Silphium and Salvia, and they're there and they're beautiful. But the important stuff are the grasses. Um, so a bit of taxonomy uh, that I'll bring up a couple of times here. Uh, one is, of course, we're dealing with the grass family, and that's the Graminii or the Poaceae, and this is one of eight families that has two accepted names. Um, and so then while you're trying to go to sleep tonight, you can try to think of the other seven. Um, <clears throat> but so they're, they're both correct names. There are about 12,000 species. So it's, it's a big family, and they occur on all the continents of the world, including Antarctica, there are two vascular plants on Antarctica. One of them's a grass, so it's 50% of the flora. And they are so common as parts of the landscape, we often don't actually pay any attention to them, right? So the grasses are there in case you hadn't had missed them. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're around everywhere. They have very distinctive leaves. They grow from the bottom of the leaf. Um, and this is thought to be an adaptation to grazing or also it's what allows them to tolerate mowing. So just a little more of that structure. Um, here's a picture of a grass plant. The leaves have a blade and then the blade actually extends into this sheath that surrounds the stem. So the attachment point of this leaf is actually down here at the bottom of that sheath. And there's a growing point at the bottom of the sheath that is a meristem and there's a growing point at the bottom of the blade. So here's just sort of a cartoon of what I just said. There's the blade, there's the sheath, and there are these growing points, these meristems that push, push the leaf up. And this continues right the way down the plant. And so that if you have a big hungry herbivore that comes along and bites the top off of it, the growing points are still there 
and it, it can tolerate that. You haven't killed the plant and it will, it will regenerate. Um, makes the herbivores very happy. And of course, the other herbivore is of course humans and lawnmowers. Characteristic of the grasses, of course, is uh, their flowers are very small. If you've tried to key out a grass, you're familiar with this problem. Um, and the older you get, the worse, the smaller the flowers get. Um, <clears throat> but they're in tiny clusters known as spikelets. Of course, the term spikelet just means little spike. So there's nothing terribly technical about it. Um, and you can see from the flowers that the stigmas are feathery like this because they catch the pollen. The grasses are wind pollinated. Um, and if anybody has hay fever, does anybody here get hay fever? Yeah, so you, you're the bioassay basically for when the grasses are shedding their pollen. Uh, yeah, humans, humans are allergic to the proteins in the pollen. So the, the dominant grasses, the things that sort of characterize the prairie are these four species. So there's big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, and switchgrass. And I'll just walk you through a few observations about these uh, one at a time, starting with big blue stem. This is Andropogon girardi. Um, and Andropogon means, and, andro means man, and pogon means beard. these three branched inflorescences um, looking kind of like turkey foot and they bloom in late summer. So if you go out into a prairie in June, it will look like absolutely nothing is happening. Everything happens very late in the season. If you grow them as ornamentals, they are absolutely beautiful uh, and they are not hard to grow. Uh, they're very striking plants. They do get kind of floppy late in the season this guy in this picture. So it's something to think about if you're going to put it in your garden, you know, sort of at the back of something, it, it will turn brown and fall over. Um, and so you'd plan accordingly, but very striking plants. Um, just for a map as to where these things occur, of course, they're all over the country. Predominantly, of course, in the Midwest, but extending all the way into New England. Um, <clears throat> And these, this light green shading indicates that the species is present and not rare, although we were chatting at dinner. Um, and you know, I, I'm pretty good at spotting this stuff and I don't see it very frequently. And I guess Matt and Melissa confirmed that it's not absent, but it's, this map gives the impression it's common and it's not that common. I think the native range is a lot in the river valleys. Um, and perhaps not quite as widespread. Although it's a favorite of the um, Department of Transportation, the highway department in many states. Um, as I said, it extends right the way across. This is a photograph of it in the front range. It's very plastic in terms of its growth habit. So this is also big blue stem. There's plenty of it out here. You can look at it and you can start seeing those very characteristic inflorescences right here. But if I put a something in there for scale, you'll notice that it's not very big. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's very dry. And so it'll adjust its height accordingly. Very high quality forage, particularly for cattle, uh, was used medicinally by indigenous Americans. Um, and it was used pretty widely across the Eastern deciduous forest to line storage pits seed storage pits, uh, if they were trying to store seeds or maize cobs, be, you'd put them in a pit, but you'd have to line that with something to keep the things from rotting. And the big blue stem has solid stems that don't rot easily. So it was, it was a pretty widespread technology that made it into, into New England as well. Second major plant is the little blue stem. Um, Schizocyrium scoparium, at least schizo means split, chirium is chaff, having to do with the shape of the inflorescence or the floral structures. It is very drought tolerant, much more so 
than big blue stem. And it's only about two or three feet tall. Yeah. What does the broom like? That's, yeah, it's, that's the, that particular species. I, although it, honestly, the, the inflorescence breaks up, I think it would make an awful mess if you tried using it as a broom, but, um, but that's what it looks like. There's, there are many, many cultivars of this, including some really beautiful ones. I actually like these, these blue ones. Um, they're you know, chosen for their color. And unlike big blue stem, they don't flop all over everything so that they're very useful horticulturally. They grow pretty easily. Again, very widespread. And this one is indeed extremely common in New England. Um, throughout just in dry sites in general. Third major one is Indian grass. So Sorgastrum nutans. Sorgastrum just being a poor imitation of sorghum and nutans being twisted. Um, this is one of the later blooming ones. It blooms in September. And so you really have to wait for it, but it makes a really beautiful display <clears throat> late, late in the year. Um, even before it starts flowering, you can usually spot it because at the top of the sheath, it has these pointy oracles, these little ears that at the very top of the sheath, it's very obvious in these guys. And it often grows in pure stands, often in very wet sites. And so when I've collected this, it's a, usually a very muddy sort of experience, um, but it'll be solid stands of this. Widespread throughout much of the country, but not that far north. So as these maps indicate, not common in northern New England, uh, more so farther south. And then the third, or the fourth one, sorry, is Panicum virgatum, switchgrass. Panicum being the Latin word for millet. Um, I can't remember what virgatum is off the top of my head. I probably knew. Does anybody know? No. Nope. Okay. The upright. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This is a nice thing about having this many botanists in one room. <laughs> is that somebody knows the answer? <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, it's received a lot of attention as a possible biofuel. Um, it's Interest has sort of died out a little bit on that. It's not clear that it's economically viable, but in the process of trying to pursue it commercially, we've learned an awful lot about the biology of the plant, um, which is just useful knowledge to have. Again, very widespread, but less so in New England, more Midwest and South. There are two others that are common although much less dominant taking over the landscape than the four I just mentioned. There's broom sedge, broom sedge blue stem, which is Andropogon virginicus, um, obviously from Virginia. So here's virginicus, grows in disturbed areas. And this is a really late bloomer. If you wanna collect it, you're going collecting in October. So everybody else is out collecting in May and June. For collecting this group, you're going out collecting now. Um, a lot of disturbed areas. It's a, it's a sort of a ruderal thing. It doesn't last terribly long. It doesn't persist in mature stands. Um, obviously dispersed by wind um, and very much a Southern, Southern species. This is Virginicus in its strict sense is, is all up in the middle part of the country. And then there a whole bunch of other very closely related species along the Gulf Coast. <clears throat> um, so it's, it's a major group, but Virginicus is pretty common. Um, and then finally, gamma grass, Trypsicum dactyloides, which is, even if you didn't know it already, is closely related to corn which I think should be fairly clear that the bottom part of the inflorescence 
has female spikelets. These are the ones that produce the seeds. And then the top part is male. So it's monoecious and looks very much like <clears throat> the, the male part in particular looks very much like the tassel on corn. Very similar. Uh, and this one, um, I've decided, I've looked for this to try to get the northernmost populations of this. And as far as I can tell, it doesn't like crossing Interstate 80. Um, I have collected it along Long Island Sound. And I have, and why it knows where that interstate is, I have no idea. But um, yeah, it's very common, sort of southern parts of the US and actually down into Mexico. These are all warm season grasses, which partly explains why they don't get their act together to flower until later in the season. Um, <clears throat> it's just not, not conducive to photosynthesizing. So they, they're all C4. Um, and the C4 photosynthesis, the high efficiency photosynthesis is not common among plants in general. Um, but it is very common among grasses much more common among grasses than other groups. And actually this photosynthetic pathway accounts for about 25% of the carbon fixed by plants, even though it's a relatively small number of species. So it's a very high efficiency. Um, and that's where the vigorous growth comes. So then if, it's, if they're really good at photosynthesizing, then there's the question of what do they do with all that? carbohydrate and sugar. And of course they put it underground because they're perennial plants. And so some of it goes to make seed and some of it goes down below the ground and they have phenomenal root systems. They're very deep and very dense. And I'll come back to this in just a few minutes because it becomes an important bit about not only the natural history but also the interaction with humans. <clears throat> so these tremendous deep root systems uh, they sequester a lot of carbon. So if you're worried about getting carbon dioxide out of the air, these guys do a real good job of it. <clears throat> uh, it's about 1.7 metric tons of carbon per acre per year. And just for comparison, a regular car produces about 4.6 tons. So about three acres of prairie will cancel out one car. Uh, <clears throat> So, and of course that carbon also improves the soil substantially because then there's bacteria and fungi and then the small animals that eat those. Um, so you end up with a very rich soil produced by these plants. So now a little more about the grass family. We've got 12,000 species. The family is divided into 12 subfamilies. And the subfamilies are still pretty big, as you might imagine. So those are divided into tribes. And all the grasses that I just introduced you to, all six of those major prairie species, are in the subfamily Panacoidae. And that's named after Panicum, which is the switchgrass genus. So they're all, I mean, not super closely related, but the same subfamily. And of those, everything except switchgrass is in a single tribe the tribe Andropogonae. So this is Andropogon, big blue stem, broom sedge, Tripsicum, the Indian grass, Sorgastrum, um, <clears throat> are all, all in this one tribe. And what characterizes the tribe is that the spikelets, these little floral units, come in pairs. So there's one spikelet, there's the other one. They're always in pairs in this tribe. And then there's one of the spikelets often has this long protrusion known as an awn. So the, the morphology is very, very similar. Once you start looking at the spikelets, here's a little blue stem, there's one spikelet, there's the other spikelet, there's the awn. Same basic ground plan. Here's broom sedge, Andropogon virginicus, there's a spikelet, there's the other spikelet, there's the awn. I'm not gonna go through absolutely everything, but I would point out that sorghum is in the same tribe. One spikelet, the other spikelet, there's the on. Okay. 
two spikelets, often but not always an arm. And the paired, the spikelets are shed as a unit. So this becomes a diagnostic combination of the paired spikelets and then being shed as a unit is diagnostic for the tribe. So outside the Andropogani, other panicoidae, other grasses, the spikelets just fall off individually, you know, just one at a time. I mean, that's what you would expect things to do. Andropogani, the inflorescence axis breaks, so the pairs fall off as a single unit, dispersal unit. You can see this more clearly. This is um, Bothria cloa from Texas. You can see one spike with the other one in the on, one, two, on, and they're, they're separate. Here, let's look at this a little more closely. Again, here's a pair and an on, and they, they separate, they break up. And you can, again, see the pairing of the, of the spikelets. And you're probably at this point wondering, what's the on for, other than decoration? There is a lot of literature on what the on is for. And the, the short answer is nobody actually knows. There are a lot of ideas out there. We have, my lab has tested a number of these ideas, and most of them don't hold up very well. So um, does the on help dispersal by animals? And the answer is mostly no, because it doesn't, you know, like if you take an animal skin or something and people have done experiments of seeing what things are stuck on what animals, they're mostly not attached to animals. So it's, it's not, doesn't seem to be working in that case, at least for the animals that anybody's looked at. And it's a fairly long list. Um, Maybe it reduces animals eating them. Maybe it's reducing predation. Uh, it's a little hard to test. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence for this, but uh, that's one possibility. Some suggestion that maybe it helps dispersal by ants because it gives the nice handle, you know, that the ants pick it up and walk off with the thing and then leave the seed behind. And um, this, that uh, we've tested this and it doesn't. The ants are just not interested. Um, maybe wind dispersal in some cases. I mean, I showed you this. This, I mean, they're, they're the long hairs that help in wind dispersal, but maybe the long on helps in this particular case or anything that's light and fluffy anyway. Maybe the on helps too. Um, and then there's some suggestion that it, they help orient the diaspore, the whole thing in the soil. And the evidence for this is very good for a few species with really huge ons, but we have been unable to replicate it in most of the other species. So the, the theory, I'll tell you the theory first and then, <laughs> then tell you. So the, the on is hygroscopic. That means as it gets moist or gets wet, it straightens out, it uncoils. And then as it dries, it coils back up. And so you've got this twisting, and straightening and twisting and straightening. And at the same time, you've got these hairs down here that anchor the thing in the soil or against rough spots in the soil. And the, the radical, the, the root comes out here. So that helps hold it in place. So the theory is that as you've got one end pinned down and then the other end is gradually twisting, straightening and twisting, that it'll help tip that thing up into cracks in the soil. And for the few species that have absolutely enormous ons, that is true. It does that. We've replicated those experiments. And it's great, except that most of the 1,200 species have much smaller ons. And we can't, with the, the species I just showed you, the ons are not that big. And we have not been able to see them do anything. I mean, the ons twist and untwist. But having it be strong enough to orient the seed uh, just doesn't seem to happen. So, so yes, it can help orient the seed in the soil, but in the species where it's been demonstrated, but not a general thing. So the answer is, we don't know. Um, so if anybody's got another testable hypothesis, I'd be happy to hear it. Um, all right. So that's a brief introduction to the plants. So then the question is, what happened 
to the tall grass prairie? Why isn't it there now? Um, and obviously we know some of the general problems of housing and shopping centers and things. Um, <clears throat> it's one of the most endangered ecosystems in North America. So there's less than 1% of it remains, which is remarkable considering how huge it was. So this is a map of the US in 1820. So this is as the westward movement is just starting. So Indiana and Illinois have just become states. The, the Northwest Territory, the old, this is the old Northwest Territory, which got broken up into the, and the, the Northwestern Reserve, um, got broken up into individual states. Of course, we've got this giant Missouri Territory and Missouri joined as everybody remembers probably from the Missouri Compromise in 1820. So there was some movement from the East out to the West. And I wanna just remind you of what I just said about the roots of the prairie. As people were moving west, of course, they wanted to turn this into farmland because everybody was farming. And so they ran into these tremendously dense root systems. And that's where I bring in a little bit of my own family history. Um, the Kellogg family is, is, Kellogg is a fairly common name, but we have a genealogy. So I can go back to my direct ancestor, John Kellogg. Um, and John is, as you can see here, it says he was a blacksmith and he left Shelburne, Massachusetts near here and moved to Madison, Ohio about 1828. And then my grandfather has corrected this to 1824. Um, <clears throat> so he moved there in 1824. And as, as this points out, he was a blacksmith. Well, what was happening with people trying to set up farms Obviously they have to plow the land and get rid of those pesky grasses, but the plow, standard plow used at that time had a share, this is the, the cutting part, was made out of cast iron. Cast iron is very brittle. It, if it runs into a rock or anything that it can't cut through, it will break. And when this kind of plow ran into those prairie root systems, there was real trouble. It just didn't work. I suspect it was very good, made a very good living for blacksmiths like John Kellogg of having to repair these things. And as some of you perhaps know, uh, in the 1830s, finally along came this cheery looking fellow uh, who is John Deere. And what John Deere did was, he, well, he moved to Illinois from Vermont. Um, <clears throat> and if anybody's tried farming in Vermont versus farming in Illinois, you can see what the appeal would be. The soil is amazing in Illinois. And he began marketing a plow with a steel share so that it was sharp enough and tough enough. So here's the John Deere plow. Here's the, the sharp steel share that was tough enough to cut through those prairie grasses. And once you cut through that, you've now got this amazing soil that these grasses had been building up since the ice age. And in parts of Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, this is really nice soil. Not a lot of rocks like you have around here. It's, it's deep, deep, deep soil. And of course, you know what happened. The major crop in the Midwest is now corn, zea maize, and some sorghum. But maize is also a member of this grass tribe, Andropagani. So you, if you look at a maize tassel, they're the two spikelets, just like they don't have ons, but it's just like the rest of the Andropagani here, there's sorghum one, two, one, two. Same thing, sorghum often has ons, okay. So what corn, we've covered basically this area with a member of this same tribe. So this is a map of corn production, it's just from USDA, corn production in the Midwest in 2017. 
And we can overlay this on the map of the tall grass prairie. And what you can see is we've basically, we've taken the native Andropagani and replaced it with a cultivated member of the same, the same tribe. And economically, this, there's, there's obviously an enormous economic driver behind this, whatever else you feel about the, the loss of the prairie, which is pretty sad, but, but Missouri produced 502, this is, this is just Missouri. So I mean, Iowa and Illinois do a lot more. I just happened to get the Missouri statistics, 502 million bushels of corn and corn. I checked the price of corn just now. And as of last week, it was $4.70, six cents a bushel. And so you multiply that out and you, you get a really big number. Um, <clears throat> And of course, you know, people who farm and sell corn pay taxes, and it's 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 a major, major part of the economy. So we basically replaced the prairie with farms, a lot of corn, and of course a lot of soybeans too. But I'm focused on the corn. So, so in the process of providing this massive amount of corn for mostly for livestock feed. That's basically, if you had meat for dinner, that animal was fed corn and you're, you're seeing the product of this, um, this particular agricultural investment. Um, what about preserving and rebuilding a prairie? And of course, there are a lot of people preserving it. I've shown you a couple of pictures of the tall grass prairie in Oklahoma, the Kanza prairie in Kansas. There are much smaller patches elsewhere. There's some beautiful ones in, in Missouri um, in various places, uh, maintained by different organizations, the Nature Conservancy, the Department of Conservation, uh, the Missouri Prairie Foundation, Paintbrush Prairie, just many places that have been preserved they are comparatively small. So the other hope with all this is reconstruction. It's not going to get back to the way it was. It's the, the native prairie is gone. But I think if you can remember the maps I just showed you, those individual species are not gone. And then therefore the, all the biology that came with those species still exists. So there's a possibility of rebuilding prairies. And I'm using the word reconstruction very deliberately. It's not restoring the landscape to the way it was, but starting on something where you may not know the history at all, but you can build, build a prairie with those species. Uh, and this is um, a, a golf course where the golf course superintendent decided for partly for environmental reasons and partly just for financial reasons to separate the fairways with native vegetation. So he got native seed of the native grasses of the ones that I just told you about. And then a lot of the, the forbs, the dicots as well, and has planted instead of having red fescue, which is kind of the standard thing between fairways, he's put in prairie. Um, at the institution where I have worked for the last nine years and I'm still partly employed is the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, um, which is a freestanding research institution in St. Louis with a mission to improve the human condition through plant science. But I'd point out part of that is this second item down here, which part of the mission is to preserve and renew the environment as to use plant science research to improve the environment. Um, before 2015, I, I started there at the beginning of 2014. So when I got there, the landscape looked like this, and there was about six acres of mowed turf grass. And somewhere along the line, somebody had the bright idea, of, think if our mission is to preserve and sustain the environment, having that much lawn is probably inconsistent with that goal. So 
how do you reconstruct the native vegetation, the native prairie? Well, the start is you destroy all the vegetation that's there. You scrape it down to mineral earth. Fortunately, they were just had decided to build a new wing, so they were digging everything up anyway. So, and I put this in here just to show you the soil, right? There was no plan to amend the soil at all, and they didn't. So there it is after the trucks and all had left. It's just down to bare mineral soil. And then it was seeded onto that bare mineral soil with a prairie mix of just native, native plants, plants that were sourced, sea sources within 100 miles of the place. A uh, few of them were covered with mycorrhizae or beneficial fungi. No fertilizer or topsoil was added. And the reason for that is that the native plants don't need it, but the more fertilizer and topsoil you put down, the happier the weeds get. So you don't put it down. And then they put in a, an annual cover crop for the first year. So in year one, what you're looking at is mostly the cover crop, but if you look right in between, you start seeing seedlings of big blue stem and little blue stem. <clears throat> and Indian grass. Of course, what you're not seeing is beautiful soil, but the seedlings are coming up in year one. Years one and two, of course, you had to mow. There was a certain amount of weeding and a few areas had to get overseeded, but that's year two. There it is. And this, sorry, this, this particular photo is a little misleading because some of these were put in as plants, as live, as mature plants. But this was all seeded, everything you're seeing here. Sophie, yes. Can I ask you about the covered crop? It was annual ryegrass. Yeah, I'm just standard stuff, just designed to hold the soil in place and then to die out. Um, this is year five. So it's doing pretty well. The wildlife and insects started coming back almost immediately, within a year. Um, and there are lots of little animals around. There are all sorts of birds. Um, and I'm, by, I'm told by people who are more familiar with insects than I am that, that there's a lot of insect diversity out there. Um, and so, yeah, let's, just, let's see if I can get this to run. Yeah, there we go. So that's last year. Um, so it's doing, so obviously it's not 10,000 years worth of soil buildup, but it's moving very much in the right direction. Um, so it is possible, in fact, then to rebuild a prairie and get something similar to what was, was removed. So with that, I'll give you another prairie picture here of the Shaw Nature Reserve. And this is also a rebuilt prairie, but it's a lot older. This, this one's about 20 years, 15 or 20 years old. Um, so, so reconstruction of prairies is not a pipe dream and it, it works. Anyway, thanks. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, um, we would, oh yeah, sorry. The question is, are we using fire? Are they using fire to maintain the prairie? Many of us are pushing for that. The city of Creve Coeur is not really excited about it because uh, there's a major, major road um, with power lines right next to it. I think it's probably going to happen. Right now it's maintained by mowing, but it would be really good if it burned. Um, and it, it's really just a question of, making sure that we've got enough fire trucks around at the right stage, because there, there are other, I mean, this prairie is burned on a three-year cycle. This one I'm showing you right here. So it's, they, you know, there are people around with the expertise to run a control to burn. Um, so it's really a question of making sure that the neighbors are all okay with the idea. Um, but it's a good question. Yeah. I was just curious about the like grass and perennial interaction because um, I come from more of like a landscape design background even though I'm looking at the ecology of all this 
but you know one of the biggest worries and I guess thoughts that I have is like these grasses sometimes tend to grow very large and some of our perennials only grow up to like maybe four feet so do they get out competed like what is that interaction that happens between you know, the grasses and the perennials out here in the prairie that kind of keeps everything in balance okay so the question was basically what's what's maintaining the balance between the grasses and the non-grass perennials. Uh, and it is almost entirely a perennial ecosystem. I mean, the grasses are perennial too. Um, and you're right, over time in some prairies, particularly the big blue stem, I mean, it, it's pretty slow. It doesn't happen overnight, but pr over time, the big blue stem can outcompete some of the other plants, although a lot of the, the dicots, the, the non-grass things out there are themselves pretty big. I mean, self, Silphium, for instance, is, is as tall as the big blue stem. But, but yes, it's a, you know, obviously the salvia is only this big. Um, partly it's a question of timing. That is, you know, for instance, there's Baptisia. I, you know, I didn't show you all the, <clears throat> all the dicots. Um, this Baptisia that blooms early in the season when the grasses are still trying to get their act together. You know, it's not warm enough for the grasses to do much of anything. So there's substantial change over the course of the season in terms of who's growing actively and blooming. But yes, you do need the disturbance. You need the mowing and the burning over time to keep those really big grasses from just taking over. Um, they're, and I, of the reconstructions I know of, I don't know of any that have been growing long enough where that's becoming a real problem. But certainly we do see, even over the very short time period that, this, that the Danforth Prairie has been growing, we've been able to see changes in the composition each year. And, and whether it's gonna settle down or whether it's gonna to continue to sort of cycle, I don't know. So yeah, it's a, it's a good question and you know, it's probably a very individual answer as well. Yeah, Keith. Two questions. Uh, first one, as a child growing up on the high plains of West Texas, the uh, <clears throat> a term that I heard so often was buffalo grass. I never heard of blue stream. Right. switch grass, things like that. It was always buffalo grass. Second question is, uh, what about bringing back the large uh, herbivores, uh, buffalo, et cetera? Are those in, so incompatible with humans that it's not considered? Yeah, so the, the first question had to do with buffalo grass. And it is really super common, like in West Texas, where you were asking about farther west, it's basically a major component of the midgrass and short grass prairie. It does occur in the tall grass prairie, but it is sort of obscured by, I mean, it runs into this same problem of you've got all these big things and then there's this buffalo grass, which is, you know, it's usually about this tall. Um, <clears throat> it does fine, super drought, much more drought tolerant than the plants I was talking about today. Um, but yeah, very common plant. And then the second question had to do about bringing back in the big herbivores to help maintain the prairie. Um, yeah, um, it's been, I don't know of any town, you know, reasonably densely populated town that would be happy to have bison walking around. They're, they're not real nice animals. They need space. Uh, we have somewhat facetiously thought about how many cows could we just bring in there for a week just to eat everything. Um, <clears throat> but, I, you know, once again, there's sort of logistics having to do mostly with working in a suburban, you know, although this is a six acre parcel, it's in the suburbs. You know, so it's, it's not, it's not like it's surrounded by wild, wild land. There's a big group in Montana trying to take take over a huge part of Montana with buffalo, and the native tribes are 
you know, horse racing in our Buffalo Bison and have made, made you know, the ranchers also are, are in and doing things right, but then there's always the ones who don't want the cowboys kicked out, you know, and they don't understand really the ecology so much. But when the ones who are doing the good stuff on the land have said it's really doing well. I guess since we're mentioning bison, don't miss Ken Burns, October 16th, PBS. <laughs> <laughs> A new movie. Okay. Yeah, the, the point was that there's, uh, for those of you who are online, um, that there, there's a lot of effort to reintroduce bison, particularly in Montana and many parts of the, the plains, um, and to build up those herds. But there's, you know, there's inevitably tension um, with cattle, um, which is, is kind of understandable. They're, they're just, you know, if you've been to any place where there, there are herds of bison running around, you know, they're, they're just not things you want to be all that close to. So, yeah, let's see, Jen, then Sarah. Sure. Um, functionally, how do prairies compare with the grasslands in the rest of the world? Okay, so question was functionally, how do the prairies compare with the grasslands in the rest of the world? They're very similar to the grasslands in Africa. And again, the dominant species in Africa are part of the same tribe, Andropagani. Likewise, India and parts of Southeast Asia uh, and parts of Australia. So the Andropagani actually covers about 17% 17 of the Earth's land surface. I didn't stick those slides in, but it's, it's a major group. So big C4 grasses, obviously in Africa, the herbivores are completely different, but they're still you know, very important. So it's it's a very similar ecosystem and probably in better shape in in other parts of the world. Where... Mongolia and Turkey. So Mongolia and Turkey are going to be cooler. And so they're going to be cool season grasses. And particularly Mongolia, it's it's going to be the cool season grasses that are and so it'll be similar in the sense that they're grasses which are grazing tolerant inherently but they're a different physiology and different structure. Partly they're just not as most, in most places, they're just not as big. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's a different group that's taxonomically and physiologically a little, a little different. But yeah, I mean, still it's a grass, still has fibrous root systems, so yeah. Um, sorry, was that the... Did you have a second question? No, that was it. Okay, great, thanks, sorry. Yeah, Sarah. Uh, so I have a couple questions on Zoom. Um, the first one is, are you having any trouble with woody plant invasion, particularly with climate change? So yes, woody plant invasion is an issue with all tall grass prairies. Um, it, it just, there's, there's enough water around and there's usually a, a good enough seed source around that woody plants just, seed in very easily. Um, I don't know the answer to the question about climate, the effect of climate change, you know, that is, is the woody plant invasion gotten worse, say over the last 20 or 30 years? Um, I want to say yes, but I don't have the data right at the top of my head. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it's an issue. Yeah. There's a second question. Okay. Do you happen to know the medicinal uses of the big blue stem? Uh, I was afraid somebody was going to ask that. I, no, I don't. <laughs> As I recall, I think it's, you know, it's stomach ailments and headaches and, you know, something fairly nonspecific. But um, yeah, another question in the back of the room, unless there's an, is, can I, okay, good. So a lot of the grasses that are available in like the horticultural tree are often most represented, I think, in the Midwest, at least like kind of in the center of the U.S. So and, and a lot of the grasses, I think, I think at least from my assumptions, that a lot of those are most represented, like sorghastrum and uh, even andropogon and glutes and stuff like that. We see more of it kind of in the Midwest and central U.S. What kind of and it's kind of weird because New England, at least when you look at the grassland, seems more old world. It's, it's like more manufactured. It's not really like, I don't really know what the 
native grassland kind of looks like here in New England, where that shows up. When I see schizocurium, it's mostly on like dry mountainsides and things right. like that. So I don't see these open areas with that. So I guess in short, my question is more like, what differences do you see between the grasslands of like the central U.S. and maybe the grasslands that would appear in New England, or should there even be a sort of grassland? Yeah. So the question is, what's the difference between the Midwestern grasslands and New England grasslands? And actually, I was having this conversation with my sister because we have some um, property up in Maine and wondering what the native grasslands look like. Because now, I mean, if you if you find a grassy meadow, it's all European introductions, as you pointed out. It's it's all pasture grasses that you know because it was settled from northern Europe. And people brought their livestock with them and they put the, you know, they ball put ballast in their ships that was soil that was full of European grasses. And so some of it was introduced direct, deliberately for fodder and some of it was introduced inadvertently. There but are native grasslands that are still, you know, it's not in your old fields, but it's, you know, Long Island's got some big ones and Cape Cod has got. You know, and they've got very diverse native flora. In so it's a, once again, it's I mean, it's not as common as it is in the Midwest, certainly, but um, they're they're here, and it's something that we've used for yeah. For so it's spread, but there are remnants. Yeah. So the the comment for the people who are online, the comment was that there are native. New England grasslands, they're on Long Island and the Cape, and they're sort of remnants. Um, certainly salt marshes were were heavily used for grazing. Um, you know, the Great Meadow in Concord, for instance, was, you know, was grazing land. Uh, but you just don't, I mean, you certainly don't see grasslands on the scale that you would in the Midwest. And it, it, I think they just so rapidly go over to trees, that it's only in certain environments that you're going to get the grasslands. But yeah, thank you for that comment, Jen, because I've been sort of wondering, well, what was here? <laughs> you know, what... I'll take you out there if you want to. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, we do see the four species represented. We do see, we do see blue stuff and, and uh, blue stuff out here so it's not i mean they're not stands of it in the same way but they're growing there naturally mm -hmm. you know and it's got to have something to do with fire mm -hmm. yeah yeah so the comment was that little blue stem and big blue stem are found around here not in the kinds of stands that you have farther west and it probably is related to fire i mean there clearly has to be some disturbance to keep the thing from just going over to shrubs and trees in this part of the country. So, yeah, yeah go ahead. So um, a lot of the time, so my theme is, you know, really restoration and wildlife, uh, storing for wildlife. And the theme is often looking at pollinators and birds and stuff like that. What's like the big selling point more grasslands in terms of like trying to get people to plant more grasses as opposed to just focusing on flowers and perennials in terms of like how it interacts with the, the biodiversity of wildlife and things like that. What would be a big selling point to kind of help convince people or convey the importance of grasses in the ecosystem? Right. So the question was, what's the selling point? If you're trying to convince your neighbors to plant grasses, you know, what do you tell them? Um, well, for starters, you're, you're reconstructing the native ecosystem and not just the, you know, the floral displays that'll, um, you know, that'll serve certain groups of insects at certain times. Um, so you get a more diverse ecosystem the, the soil is certainly one, one major, you know, one major benefit. 
you know, the other thing in terms of what is effectively an institutional landscape, like what I was showing you, is it's cheaper to maintain. It's not free. Um, that is, you still have to pay attention to the weeds and you still have to mow it. But um, the, our, the manager at the Danforth Center estimates that the cost of maintaining those six acres of prairie is about a third of what it was maintaining six acres of turf. Uh, with obviously a lot less pesticides and herbicides. And I guess that would be the other, another argument for the grasses is just in terms of keeping weeds out and reducing pests. You know, they just, they occupy, they occupy ground. So instead of you not having to mulch things so much. Um, but yeah, you do have to get used to a different aesthetic. Um, I mean, there's no question about it. If, if you're among the people that likes mowed turf and carefully pruned shrubs, it's just, yeah. I mean, a, a grassland just isn't going to do it. Um, so, restoration. yes. So, what other type of wildlife grasses? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So, the, yeah. The the question was whether the grasses, what other wildlife are supported by the grasses? And of course, a lot of small mammals. I mean, we get a lot of hawks. Just. Um, and I, they must be finding something to eat. Um, they occasionally go after small dogs and um, haven't gotten one as far as I know. But the ducks never, and the ducks in the pond never last very long, right? There's a question in the way back and then Sarah. Um, they're drought tolerant. Yes. Um, with those really deep roots. Yeah. Yeah, they are drought. Even if they're in the drought. Yeah, they're drought tolerant. You don't need to water them. But once they're established, you know, give them a couple of years and then then they're just fine. So let's see, Sarah, and then, yeah, okay. Um, another question from Zoom, and it goes right along with what you were just talking about. Do you have any recommendations for using native grasses in bobolink habitats? Uh, bobolink, thank you. Yeah, um, I don't know about the preferences specifically for bobolink. Um, I, yeah, hmm? do you know? Short grass. Okay. Right. Not okay. So the, the comment from the audience is short grasses, not not the ten foot tall ones. I think you know. I think there's an argument, particularly if you've got a small space, that you don't want the really big ones anyway. So right. Yeah. What kind of genetic diversity do you see within one of these species? Like where it's a very widespread species. If you take a seed from South Texas and you put it in Maine, how well is it going to do or does it really matter? That's a great question. Um, and we have not done that particular experiment, but we have good measures of the diversity and it depends on the species. Sorry, I should repeat the question. The question was, how, how is the genetic, how much genetic diversity is there within one of these widespread species and how is it partitioned? That is, you know, are the main species, main plants substantially different from Texas plants? Um, <clears throat> it depends on the species. So the big blue stem is surprisingly uniform across its range. It does not partition out into regional population groups, which was not ex an expected result. Um, the other species, there's a little more population structure. The um, Broom sedge, the Andropogon virginicus, has pretty strong population structure. Um, so it, it, it really varies depending on the species. Most of them are pretty flexible in terms of their habitat demands. So it, you know, it, it's, it's hard to know if somebody actually did the experiment you just proposed, which is just a, a straight swap my guess would be that there's still some local adaptation, but it's not that, not that striking, at least for most of the species. But yeah, it's a, it's a good, good question. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.